do it from different disciplines. Yesterday, we heard about the buried memory and the architecture of shelters. But today, we're going to go on the surface. We're going to talk about the bombings and, see, and talk about policies regarding the memory that can be implemented. And we're going to do it from different point of view. We have Laia Gallego with us. <laughs> She's a pre-doctoral researcher at the Department of Archaeology of the University of Barcelona. She has a master's in contemporary history by the University of Barcelona. She's a specialized in archaeology of the contemporary past. She has been researching on damage uh, done by uh, the bombings during the Civil War. She has published Wundic, Wounded Buildings and she's also a member of uh, Memoria Sutarrada Association, and she's going to tell about us later, that has created a digital platform to recover the memory and the heritage of the bombings of the Civil War. Wounded buildings that she claims have to be seen as heritage in our current times. Jordi Guichet is with us today. Welcome again. He is director of Rome, the European Observatory of Memory. Uh, he is also associate professor at the University of Barcelona. He's got a PhD in uh, history by the Sorbonne University. He's a specialist on public policies on memory and also Francois repression on um, people who have to exile after the Spanish War and the Second World War. He was head of heritage of Memorial Democratic of the Catalan government. He has published República Perseguida, Exili y Represió a la Francia de Franco. I'm going to introduce also Cristina Lucas, artist. Hello, Cristina. She's a well-known uh, artist in Spain. She comes from Andalusia. She lives in Madrid. She has a multidisciplinary work. She has worked with uh, drawing and other techniques. And at the end of last year, the Andalusian contemporary art was um, organized an exhibition on Cristina's trajectory. And all her projects are based on intense research projects with a feminist uh, look, questioning the power structures. And we would like to uh, talk about an exhibition, Manchas in el Silencio, that was shown in Madrid, where she reflected on memory and violence of bombings on civil population from uh, 1912 to present times, an exhibition that uh, we will be able to talk about. So Cristina is going to talk from an art point of view. Thank you, Cristina, for being with us. And finally, Ricard Martinez, a visual art researcher, professor. He created Archaeologia del Punt de Vista Association. His research or his method is brief photography. It's linked to the perception of present times by analyzing the records from the past. So he repeats historical images at the same place and using a methodology that encompasses a research. Ricard has organized several exhibitions in the public space that maybe you know and that we will be able to discuss. We have so very different perspectives in this panel, plastic arts, photography, archaeology. We will start with the first intervention by our panelists, and then we will open a Q&A session, and the audience will be able to participate. Laia. Let's start with you. How do you think we have to build these uh, memories of the bombings? You talk about these wounded buildings. Can you tell more about tell us more about these wounded buildings? Thank you very much first of all for having me to letting me participate in this seminar even be part of this extraordinary panel. 
As Carolina has mentioned, I'm going to present a collective project that we have uh, done from Memoria Suterrada organization. And the project we've been carrying out and the reflections coming from this project can answer the question how working with materials, with objects can allow us to work about heritage and also memory. So we are at an intersection point between heritage and memory. And from our perspective, we don't have to separate these two visions, but to put them together. Memory can help us with heritage, and heritage can help us with memory. Why did we start working with uh, the um, remnants of bombings, with what was left from the bombings? Well, contemporary archaeology, and uh, Mr. Moshenka was telling us yesterday about that. So the material things uh, have particular features. We have this power of revelation, so we can see, we can see these things, whether we want to see them or not, and we can reflect on them. So this materiality brings in front of us, in front of our eyes, um, these objects, and we can see emotion and um, fear resonance as well, this materiality, we can see through our body, through our senses. It's a potentially something that we can use to understand contemporary uh, history um, using our body senses, and that can help us understand. And uh, Mr. Moshenka has um, extensively published about that. And we can think, why do we want contemporary archaeology if we already have a contemporary history and we know a lot? Yes. Maybe archaeology, as we have seen in some examples, can give or take us somewhere where the history uh, cannot take us because there are not oral sources or documents. So the archaeology can help us fill the gaps. But for us, acknowledge is important. And archaeology help us to see events from a different perspective. And this has to do with this uh, democratic ideal of archaeology, because uh, documentation um, or uh, documents at a certain time belong to a certain part of the population, whereas materiality belongs to all the population. As we have seen in the previous presentation, the experience of bombings is a memory that could be felt through the bodies, uh, through the senses. So we thought that working with something material that could be perceived through our body can help to develop empathy in order to build this collective memory and in order to also um, educate or convey knowledge. The traces of uh, bombings or the footprint of bombings is something that we can see in our landscape. We can see it in many points of our geography. geography. We see permanently this sort of materiality, these bombings, the damage that has been approached in different ways. There have been different initiatives concerning these marks. And that shows that these marks are important. And maybe what we have to do is uh, work on them. The Victoria Albert Museum here, for instance, they have also work on these marks left 
by these events here tem contemporary conflicts that have led to collective uh, processes like Peronceli House, the neighbors of the area ask for this um, heritage to be preserved. Because more than reconstructing the story, what we wanted is, is to, to relieve the bombings. What does it mean to be in a city which uh, is bombed? What uh, means that for decades you see the wounds in the buildings, the marks of the bombings in the buildings? Uh, as you have seen in the previous presentation, the understanding the military tactics, uh, well, this has been well studied. Many people have done research on that. However, maybe it would be uh, interesting to work on this uh, living experience or what it means experiencing bombings. We need to understand that total war is a technique or a way of seeing the war that developed at a time when uh, the enemy had to be destroyed that led to different methodologies to um, technical progress and through research that was done at the moment, we can see that bombings were not useful, however, they were used. And as Jonathan Glover was mentioning in his book about the oral dimension of the 20th century, the alienation of violence is very important. It's a violence that takes place at the distance. You don't see the victim. You don't see the political affiliation, the age. And that's an important factor. You don't have to look in the eyes uh, to your enemy. And you don't face this moral dimension. And the experience in the collective memory has uh, led to a series of reflections on trauma that the authors you see mentioned here uh, have been working on. And in taking into account all this framework, we have proposed this collaborative website. It's a project that wants to see the marks in these wounded um, buildings, and that's and we want the population to do that. We think that building collective this knowledge can be a way of building this or transforming this into a collective process of memory, because the population will appropriate this memory. And in this way, the memory will be something alive. So here, we see that this can have an educational consequences. And we know also that when memory, for memory to be alive has to be a collective memory, a memory that the population has. We have organized seminars with the students here, a student 16, 17 years old, high school students that work with these remnants, with these objects. We have uh, documents that we have studied the damages uh, caused by the bombings and see how these marks of the bombings um, persisted throughout the decades. Here, um, there are documents where um, 
specifying the damages caused by the bombings and the states of the the state of the buildings, and we want to see what has happened with these buildings uh, during all these decades. Have the buildings been renovated or not? We have also information about court cases, uh, and here we have the name also of the victims, and we have another source, which are the oral sources that um, tell us about this um, body aspect I was mentioning. Remembering the bombings is something that can be done through the body. I interview Marie Angels Ardanui that unfortunately she died. And when I talked to her, she was mentioning the sound, the 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 smell, uh, how things were shaking, how the body was shaking, and uh, she was saying that she, the bombs were dropping and she thought she was going to die. She had really this feeling that she was going to die. And Martilde Alcázar, that, that was published in a book, and it shows this perception of trauma that you go back home, you see that the roof has fallen, but your mind cannot understand it. And you go up the stairs up to a point where you see that the stairs stop and your home is not there anymore. And this is what we want to recover, connect with the sources we have in the 21st century uh, through the buildings. San Philippe Neri has very well uh, studied, and these marks on the wall um, gives us an extra possibility. Here in San Philippe Neri is very obvious, but we can find similar marks in other buildings that gives us information. San Neri is particularly interesting why it has been preserved, because the square was completely renovated in uh, decades ago, but at that point it was decided to keep this facade, several facades with the marks. Why? And it was done uh, under Franco. Well, um, according to the sources, it was because it has to do. It had to do with uh, history. And maybe here the task is to build more content. And then we have also buildings that are no longer there. Plaza Nova, where Maria Angel Sardanui lived at the time, and buildings that are not there anymore, or new buildings, maybe in a street, we say, oh, this building here, it looks odd. All this is also part of the memory of our city. So by recovering in a collective way these spaces, we want to create memory spaces by doing research. There are memory elements that have been created in these uh, spaces, and that's a way of um, remembering uh, the bombings. All this information is in this, uh, can be found in the website. Here you can see some images of the website, but not to go too much into detail. What you can see here is a short guide on how to see the marks, how to introduce them in the website. It can be done uh, through uh, smartphones. And here we have a section, uh, participate, and a person can give information, can upload uh, photographies. And here you can see the participations we have had in our website concerning different uh, heritage link to the bombings. These are 
this is the website to have an idea on the different marks and the information provided. And uh, these are elements for the uh, debate. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias, Laia. Thank you, Laia. Well, now we have a few ideas that we can use for the debate later. Materialities for everyone, the remembrance potential, and citizen participation in and projects like the one Laia presented, wooden, uh, wounded buildings. I would be a bit of a bridge between this materiality that you talked about, Laia, and other ways of disseminating, recuperating, interpreting, and remembering. I will insist on heritage a lot, and prof probably the professionals here in the room from the municipal sphere and the regional sphere also have some responsibility in this area. And we will get into something that is becoming increasingly becoming of interest. And I will try to be a bridge also with contemporary art work and its big capacity for intervention, not only in the public space, but also with the performing arts and in interpretation. Also, I'll try to be bridge in this heterogeneous presentation. And then I'll pass the floor over to Christina Lucas, welcome, who will present her project. In a way, two ideas that have already come up, but I wanted to insist on this, on how we recover this subsoil, the memory of the bombings through shelters, which is the topic at hand today. And what do we say and what do we not say? And what type of intervention? I'll show you some pictures later. I could have brought a lot more. And later, what actions can be conducted? I think you talked about signposting and plaques and a maybe unified system. Well, I cannot give an, an analogy, but yeah, we could have this stopper sign system for the underground not only about shelters, but the memory of these shelters and these bombings in the public space from the point of view of the heritage of the city and in our contemporary times. And as was said, and I'll repeat, there was an attempt more than a decade, decade ago to have these this remnants of past violence be preserved and many municipalities and town councils who are here and who have presented posters and who take care of this heritage, you have to protect it. These remnants have to be considered heritage, at least uh, for them to be considered as elements of local interest, of national interest. And so that we can start making decisions. I've always said, and you know that I always say, that we have to know before we act. And giving them, uh, giving these elements the category of BCIN, the cultural good of national interest, is no guarantee of anything. We have a BCIN in Corbera, and 7 million euro was required, so the Actions and I think uh, the amount awarded will be 150,000 uh, euros, which is is good for nothing. It doesn't even amount to the amount necessary for the dig. So, um, well, there's a lot of debate around public policies. And without further ado, I did bring you some references of how to integrate those shelters in the underground, but also in on the surface, and a few ideas of how it's been done in other places. This is the Bercourse Natural Park to give significance to this, this place. This was a resistance space and then in small spaces in the underground in shelters they've been able to imagine, for example, Karma said this, this the possibility to make management of these recovered spaces easier and cheaper so that they can be profitable from the point of view of public investment. These are options 
that with a simple museum project, an evocative one, this is a case of a basement where the Germans got a few members of the resistance uh, underage of this village for a course, and they shot them by this wall. And in a way, the municipal services opened up this shelter, and it can be visited for free. And in the afternoon, the municipal services, they, they make a round, they check that everything is OK, and there is not much to vandalize in there. So, and when we have larger spaces, such as this huge bunker and this huge shelter uh, that belongs to the Cold War, to a different time, and it's huge. It has three levels underground. It belonged to the Ministry of Telecommunications of the DDR, and all of the secret services uh, were here. And it was built on a mobile concrete base with a whole sound isolation system. And they had those macro computers on, that, on each level. And recovering these spaces is not as easy as what we do with small shelters, like the shelters we have in Barcelona, Catalonia. But it also involves a lot of effort. This space can only be visited um, by archaeologists and architects in arranged visits. For many years, it was used because there were even dining halls in there. It was like a micro city inside. And it was used by young people to drink in there. And in one of those parties, they lit one of the floors on fire. So there's, there are important security hazards. These galleries. They're soot from the fire, so and that can be toxic. So some floors cannot be accessed, and they've reinvented themselves. They have reinterpreted themselves. And above that bunker, there is a contemporary art space where they talk about the memory of the Cold War, and they host shows. This was a show to commemorate uh, 30 years of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And this was a show that was done out there in the open. And this space is really interesting. The, the, the gate to access this is part of a, 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 an apartment building. And there are other ways of making this heritage visible. This is in Granollers. They had a lot of uh, debates about how to recover this space that was in a public square. And they use more hydraulic creative systems, that many of you know. And maybe 307 is a space, for example, where there have been theater plays performed, and it has been used for exhibits. And maybe it is a more themed uh, shelter. You'll hear this afternoon about the one in Gracia, which is in a different situation. It's more austere and more in the original status. I guess you know what this is. Anyone who doesn't know what this is, we're amongst experts here. Anyone who doesn't know what this is, well, aside from our foreign guests, anyone would like to say what this is? When we ask the students or when we ask in other conferences, many people do not know what this is. We reassessed this monument a few years ago to make it more visible. Here we have responsibles from the municipality, Jauma. And I'm not saying that this project was better or worse, but we need to rethink the visibility of the bombing commemorative monuments and so as to integrate them in the network of the old and new shelters and maybe integrate this monument in a more expressive and visual manner. I don't have the pictures because together with Nuria Ricard and some 
master students of Beaux Arts. We conducted this project. I don't have the pictures, but the idea was to dignify the area in front of the Coliseum, former theater, horizontally. And remembering what was done in active and passive defense, and we dignified the space with a surface action. Uh, we, for example, took all of the motorbikes away from this area, and you know that to, to dignify is also a very important element. It's a bit of a, a criticism on art and public space. Another example, Santa Margarita dos Monchos in La Garriga, they've done many things. In terms of management, there is municipal responsibility. And thanks to this municipal responsibility, many of the shelters still exist and can be visited. And one of these examples, maybe, so as not to talk always about Barcelona, is Agramun. And what's interesting here, and this will lead us to talking about comp contemporary art and other actions, was the recovery of these or the rehabilitation of this shelter, one of the few under a Romanic uh, church. This one is indeed a uh, cultural good of national interest. The Eret shelter was built below the church. Agramun was bombed in 70% of this surface, they said, with military targets. But uh, honestly, they were just sweets um, factories there, so it couldn't be very strategic for the war. And here they have plaques with historic um, explanations, very brief ones. And the priest and the religious community collaborated in this rehabilitation. The shelter can still be visited is one of the most visited shelters outside of Barcelona. And as you know, it can be visited at 1 p.m. now. They hold the mass at 12. There are like 30 people for the mass. And then afterwards, at 1 p.m., there's always a long line of people wanting to access the, the shelter. The rector there is not very happy about all this. And I'm linking this to another space, another memory, which is very much related to contemporary art and a different view of the bombings. The Guinobart Foundation, which is right next to the church, and if you've never been there, you should go. And here we have, for example, this, this art piece, which is La Cabana. Josep Guinobart lives in Barcelona. He's a contemporary artist. And he escaped the bombings in Barcelona and went to Agramun, the city of his family. And he went to Agramun to take shelter, but he could have never imagined that Agramun would be 70% destroyed by the bombs. And he ended up going to one of those cabins uh, in the in the field that sometimes uh, farmers use to store things, um, one of those huts, and. His entire work revolves around these huts and burned wood. And, well, he had no idea he would become one of the key contemporary artists of our time in our country. And this hut evokes these uh, bombings that took place nearby. And this link of the foundation with the shelter is very interesting. And it's a, a small example of local action and this transformative capacity. And this leads us to talking also about other actions, a lot more contemporary, in this case, in collaboration with the Barcelona Town Council. This is Alborn Center, the memory center of Alborn in Barcelona. They held this exhibit. There was another one by Xavier Domenic, which um, was a traveling exhibition all over Italy. And this one was a lot more artistic because it also showed not the, the discovery, because we had already many of these drawings, but well, it, it, it showed, it exhibited uh, drawings from the children of Barcelona between public and private foundations. Many of these drawings were collected and they were exhibited in this more or less creative manner to stress the 
the strength of these children who never knew they would leave a legacy. And these collections, part of this collection had remained in Vic for a project of the University of Vic, and it is now again available to everyone in the Municipal Archives of Barcelona. One part came out of here, one part came from a private collection in the United States bought by the Quakers and the Quakers and a, a Catalan aficionado bought all of these drawings. And this is a very interesting story because the first exhibit took place in 1937 in the United States because the Republic needed some propaganda and they created a narrative not so much historic narrative about the bombs and the bombings, but a reflection on these these drawings and these creations through these pictures. We've talked about San Felipe Neri, and this is why I bring this work by Fernando Prats. You talked about materiality. I guess you know this work. He textured the materiality of San Felipe Neri, and he showed this texture with his piece. I don't know if it remained in the uh, in the property of the town council. Oh, it is uh, in the hands of the MUBA, the, the museum, the History Museum of Barcelona. All right, so congratulations that you kept it. So in the end, this takes us, and I'll, and I'll finish now, to a reflection uh, of a, about Kinovart. As, as an adult in Agramunt, he paid homage to his colleague Pablo Picasso and the Guernica bombing. And he created this piece where international conflicts are, are very relevant. International and, and local conflicts are very important in his work. And I guess you know these this work, this, this porch, which is kept at the History Museum of Barcelona. And he told us about its meaning. And in the back of this porch, or this arcade, he wrote about many of uh, the conflicts and the perplexity of the present time. And this is a gateway from the past to the future, the gateway of memory. And there you can see a list of conflicts that he dated and documented artistically, of course, with this piece. And of course, with a difference, because you said that art can be healing of these traumas. And I think contemporary art is, as I said before, one of the things that we need to integrate in these muse museification processes in those of us who work in, more, in a more interdisciplinary fashion between architecture and museums. And I encourage you to be a part of what Ramon Ramat said, this, this task force that we have together with Granollers and Guernica, and this year we'll work between Granollers and Barcelona. And this in, in this task force, you're all very welcome those of you who from archaeology, civil society associations work on this concept, and obviously on contemporary art. We will continue to work on contemporary art. And in a way, and I'll finish with this, well, and Christina will also present a piece, the idea of which is to document and give dates and names about these traumas and these international bombings. And that will be all. Thank you very much. And I'll pass the floor over to you. Thank you, Jordi, all for all these examples. And now we go into the contemporary art world. Cristina, you're going to tell us about an installation, El Rayo Que No Cesa. I was telling you that she opened an exhibition in Madrid, and one of the most important works was this one, this installation, El Rayo Que No Cesa. And she's going to tell us more about this installation. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. 
I've been uh, hearing very interesting things, and I'm going to tell you about a never-ending project, unfortunately. So I'm going to start telling you that I was invited uh, to Vitoria to commemorate the 75th anniversary of Guernica. Guernica is this iconic painting. We know a lot about the painting and about Picasso and the exhibition, universal exhibition in Paris in 36 and what it meant. It created or it became a symbol in a way that in other words, in the bombing, when the war was declared, uh, the mural of Guernica and uh, here Colin Powell decided to give a speech behind or in front of this uh, mural because it's associated with the despair of the victims. So everyone has a place in this painting. This uh, feeling of uh, despair is reflected here. And um, the whole story, how it was taken away from MoMA and how this was the beginning of democracy for uh, Spain. And in the 70s, all Spanish uh, um, homes had a replica of Guernica. And uh, it's inside us. And for this anniversary of Guernica, I, well, I didn't know exactly what to do. Uh, however, uh, when you start reading, it's the biggest bombing in history, the one of Guernica. That's not true. Is the first bombing on civil population. It's not true. And I think that uh, this, when talking about this painting, um, I don't know, there has been um, this idea of, of, of getting a political angle. And uh, I come from Andalusia. And I knew that about the bombings on civilians trying to escape uh, Malaga and other Andalusian cities. Uh, I knew it was brutal. Many people died. I knew about that. I knew that uh, in Durango, a few days before uh, Guernica had been bombed, Barcelona had suffered terrible bombings. So many bombings had taken place. The first bombing during the civil war on civilians um, happened in the Republican side, and in Tangiers, they wanted to bomb a military barrack, but instead of that, uh, a, a civilian neighborhood was uh, bombed. These were collateral victims, but uh, the fact is that they were bombing. So I wanted to document uh, bombings on civil population uh, during the civil war, three years of war. Let's do research on both sides, because dying because of a bomb, being a victim without protection, being the victim of technology, that's a brutality regardless the side you're on. So then during the Spanish Civil War, and as it has been mentioned this morning, as Antonio said, sorry, Ramon mentioned, there was the war uh, between China and Japan, and there were bombings in Manchuria with lots of civil uh, victims. I didn't know what to do with this information. When studying the Spanish Civil War, there were many bombings by Spain in the Rift area in northern Africa, and permanently uh, there were the bombings of by Italians in Abyssinia. So I decided that the Spanish Civil War was n n narrow to talk about bombing civilians. When uh, if bombing civilians means bombing civilians everywhere, and this started when uh, uh, aviation started not that long ago. 
So we have uh, the Portuguese, Santos Dumont, and Wright, more or less at the same time, managed to fly aircraft. And thanks to this formula you see on the screen, that was at the beginning of the 20th century, 1903, or maybe um, end of uh, 19th century. This uh, um, lift formula, if we implement it to something heavier than air, well, and it's based on the third law of Newton and uh, the fluid studies of Bernoulli, and this magical dream of being able to fly became a reality at the beginning of the 20th century. This is the formula, the whole formula, what explains that flying ex is possible. The first bombing on civil population happened during the war between Italy and Turkey starting in 1911. The newspapers talk about a bombing with uh, civil casualties because they were going to inspect the land. Someone who has a grenade in his hands and threw the grenade in 1912, there are already recordings of civil deaths due to bombings. So I thought it was, they thought it was a good idea and started the air bombings at that time and uh, it has never stopped. During the First World War, there were many air bombings. During the two main wars, there were also bombings. The Spanish Civil War, and then we have the Abyssinia War, many conflicts with the colonies that, we, that are called colonial control, not even colonial war, because uh, you go there, you bomb, you don't have to uh, take troops there. It, it's so fast, it's so technological that it's, it's, it's the super efficiency what uh, gives meaning to this uh, efficiency. This book was published in 2003, and it has an explanation, almost a daily explanation of what happened during the Spanish Civil War and with a particular focus on Catalonia because the historians who wrote it are Catalan. I don't know if you know them. Uh, probably they are cl close friends of yours. I didn't know them. But a curator who was helping me in the exhibition told me, and he's Cuban, Ah, Spain in flames, wow, that's quite a thing. And he told me that uh, that in Cuba, that was a cocktail that it's done with uh, Terry, Malla Dorada, and cider, El Gaitero cider. That was a drink in Cuba, Spain in flames. And, and they put some cherries also, and people drank this. Uh, so when we did the opening of the exhibition, we served that uh, drink. So I started to get all the data, starting with this uh, book, and then I talked to other people. Someone has mentioned that the Basque Country government has a big archive uh, with documents for all the uh, with all the documents. I uh, consulted these documents. I, um, the government of Aragon as well. I think that the Spanish Civil War is well documented in this project. We have a database, but not all wars are well documented. This is why this is an ongoing project, because I pretend to have all the information concerning bombings on civil population. All the data are included in the database with different research groups. 
And in the database, we can see who has introduced the data. The data. We have several data concerning famous bombings because uh, publicity and uh, uh, advertisement uh, plays a role. Um, it's a database. We can go over the data, and if they are false data, can be taken uh, away. And here, during the Second World War, there were bombings all <coughs> over the world, the planet. Here you can see the project. On the left the screen, we have the name of the war, who bombards whom, who is bombarded uh, whom, the name of the city, how many civil casualties. In the center screen, we have the map with the bombarded city that stays here, it doesn't go away. And on the right-hand side, Sign, um, site, we have the, an image of the disaster that the bombing uh, creates. And here we have the date in the lower part of the screen. How do we manage the data? People who work in the project, uh, volunteers or groups or uh, universities, introduce the data that can be seen in the database. And we have also the reference of people, books, websites, institutions taking part. Because here we have different uh, points of view. It's a project that does not have a specific intention. We want to gather data to try to prove uh, events. So technology changes, and we have four chapters. The first one is uh, when the aviation started till the end of the Second World War, 1945. Everything is black and white with a low-level technology not sophisticated technology. Second chapter is the Cold War till the fall of the Berlin Wall. So better technology here. We have color pictures. Weapons became more sophisticated. It would be the statics of the third chapter begins with the falling of the Berlin Wall till the pandemic. Be even wars and bombings stopped when the pandemic started. It has this different static uh, blue kind of television Google Maps uh, look. And the technology here is much more for sophisticated. And the fourth chapter with a different look, with different photographies and a more advanced technology. What happens with images? The images uh, are always the same. Images of destruction, houses being destroyed, cities destroyed, people fleeing, refugees. It's a permanent déjà vu. There are no changes. And the images of weapons of technology, this techno war changes. These images change a lot because we go from artifacts that fail um, when achieving their goals to something that looks like a video game. The words right now look like a video game. In fact, one of the images I have shown you was when this project was shown in the Manifesta of Palermo in 2018. In Palermo, there are a huge antennas, and without them, drones cannot be directed to bomb Middle East in the Middle East region. So everything is connected. 
This exhibition is when traveled to Japan in um, in Wanapan um, metro station, underground station, and people took shelter there. So it was uh, uh, quite impressive to see the exhibition in a place where Japanese people um, used to go to take shelter, and people spent hours and hours looking at the ex visiting the exhibition. I'm going to show you a little bit part of the video because it's uh, everything is in silent. All the references, all the people that have taken part in the project, uh, books, institutions, everything is well documented in the database, but also in the exhibition. This has to be part of the exhibition because uh, there is always uh, that comes and say, my uh, town was bombed. Do you know? Do you have it in your project? Well, if you have it, you show it to that person. And if you don't have the information, you include the information in the project. The project is an open one. I think now it's uh, been shown in Arnie Museum in the Netherlands, uh, and they show every year this exhibition to uh, remember the Arnie bombing. This is the Spanish Civil War. We need the two screens that would go on the side, but to show you how it works. We have the city, the bombing. We, when a civilian dies, there is one ex small explosion. And where many people die, the explosions are uh, more powerful. And the data are on the screen on the left and the images on the sc in the screen on the right. It's to have a visual idea of what happened, because artists produce images. This is what I think. And trying to understand something uh, that it's difficult to understand, well, I think that we can do it by using technology with the help of data and putting together technology and data. And you can see on the lower part what Spain did to the reef. That, uh, terrible. I remember that uh, they told me, Christina, but uh, we cannot do this project because we cannot read what's in the screen. I saw it and I said, yeah, well, maybe you, we cannot read it, but we can feel it. This, this is a stain in the north of Africa. Maybe you cannot read it, but you can feel what happened. So we decided to leave it like that. I, the visitor can have an idea of what's happening. Here we zoom out because the wars in other parts of the world star. What you can see in the upper part is the First World War. Then the Basque country was heavily bombed during the Spanish War. Uh, Madrid, Catalonia, the Valencia region were heavily bombed. And visually, we can understand. There would be also other ways of understanding it. It's but what we see here is very powerful. There are data that can be made visible in this way, and otherwise it would be more difficult to make them visible. I was mentioning Arnhem and the museum in the Netherlands. They have this sort of ritual of showing this project every year and contributing to the project and um, showing it to students and trying the, or asking the students to feed the project. Uh, 
<coughs> Throughout the project, you see how the project started. Starts in 1912. People seeing it, ah, maybe um, I was born when this war um, happened, or I. People empathize. And when I was doing the project, this what happened to me. Once the project has, um, as the project unfolds, because we have some words that are not well documented, and when we show the project, we enrich the project. Uh, our idea is that this uh, database can be open uh, as a sort of Wikipedia for people to contribute. However, we are still at a stage uh, a little bit like the first uh, maps that were done. Um, you know, we're, we're constructing we're the first maps that uh, Navigation, you know, the first charts that were navigation charts were done. I think that we are at that stage. Uh, this uh, project uh, needs to evolve. We have the structure and we can feed data and information to the project. <laughs> So we zoom out or we zoom in because things are happening in other places. The video lasts seven hours, so it's difficult to see the video associated with the project, the seven hours. No one can stay for seven hours, so what I decided to do in the end is to make a sort of summary. Here you can see uh, an images where you can see the wounds, the scars, very harsh word, uh, words. We can see here this tissue, this uh, fabric. Here there is an embroidery with a light fabric. So translate this information into this uh, embroidery. Uh, here we have these stains that we know how to read them. This is a selection. It's another way of seeing data. Thank you, Christina. Enhorabuena por, por el proyecto, que ya es como un proyecto de vida, de alguna manera. Sí. Luego quizá nos puedes contar, ¿no? También que ido recogiendo entre el público que ha visto esta pieza en diferentes lugares. Congratulations on the project, which is a live project. And we'll go back to that later. But now on to Ricard's presentation. Uh, Ricard, Cristina connects past bombings with present bombings, and you, with your work, connect past and present and re-photography. So tell us. Well, hear me, I'll speak close to the microphone because I tend to speak in a quiet voice. Thank you, Cristina. Thank you, Eurom, Jordi, for inviting me. Un honor um, compartir taula amb vosaltres i compartir presó. It is an honor to share a panel with you and a prison with all of you. We must have done something if we're all here today in this prison. Comença amb aquesta frase que ja... I'll start with this quote that I will read to help the interpretation team. Sometimes different cities take place on the same soil and under the same name, and they are born and they die without having met one another, incommunicable. This is something that Italo Calvino wrote about invisible cities. We are here to establish contact between these incommunicated cities. And as a part of this big project, I will talk about my work. I look for the footprint, not so much of the attacks, but the pictures documenting the raids. 
I will start talking about one of my first projects, the material with which you fill out a crater in 2006. It was a project that integrated the archive as well because it was about documenting, compiling the pictures that recorded the attacks suffered in Barcelona during the civil war. And I looked for those pictures in Barcelona, in the same place where the events, the attacks, had taken place. In that way, the search itself was part of the project, because my premise was that those memories had always been here, in the place where they had taken place, even during the dictatorship. They had always been available. And maybe this talked about the opportunity, maybe the political opportunity of recovering them or not. This work was done in 2006 when an entire generation of the grandchildren of the people who had done and suffered the war were active. And we had enough distance but enough proximity so as to go back to this fact and recover them. So I think this is a topic for the debate as well. And I'll tell you about these pictures. I work with argentic material. This is a slide. I compiled the pictures and I went to the places. For example, when I took this picture, this was Torres Street in Gracia. And today it is called Plaza del Gato Pérez. And on one of the windows, you could still see a scar. The building has been remodeled, rehabilitated, and it's hidden now. The scar of the first bombing, bombing in Barcelona, 14th February, Valentine's Day in 1937. This is a picture by my favorite author, unidentified author. Quite a lot of production, this unidentified author. You can see it, the, the overlapping, it's quite simple. And when you continue searching, you find uh, new, new materials and I incorporate them. This is also my favorite author, but also pictures by Agustí, Santellas, Campaña, all of them in the same place, documenting the same attack. Sometimes it's not necessary for you as a new author to go there and take a new picture. Sometimes it is enough to connect those pictures, like Italo Calvino said, uh, connecting the cities. This is 14th March 1937, after the first air raid in the city. This was Creu dels Moulets Street. And again, my favorite author, unidentified author. Here, uh, this picture was by Agustí Santellas, another unidentified author, this time working for the Propaganda Commission. Santellas, unidentified author. Pérez de Rozas was a photographer here, and Santellas again. So at least three photographers were in the same place, in the same balcony, doing their job. And it also talks to us about a different thing, the point of view. We must think that back then, photography had gotten rid of the laboratory. You did not need a whole laboratory, carrying a whole laboratory with you and you no longer needed a tripod. The photographers could take a picture from whenever and however, but they all chose the same place for this one. Another piece that I started on in argentic material and continuing with digital. And I had the old picture, which was simple, and then I started taking pictures of the clouds in this very place, and I made this collage in which I incorporated other clouds, more distant, which were the um, clouds of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. So it talks to us also about how, for example, in uh, the Spanish war in one night, three planes were the terror of one city. And later on, one single plane was able to destroy an entire city. And this was Granulles. This picture 
by Ramon Parera, engineer of the Passive Defense Board. And it was shot at a very special time. While he was, sh well, I was shooting the picture, there was an, an homage, the victims being paid at the cemetery. This is why there's a difference in the lighting. There are more examples, but in 2008, thanks to the Democratic Memorial, I was able to make my first exhibit. I selected five of the pictures and blew them up in real size to real size, and I placed them in the location where they were taken. taken. This is Jardines da Gracia, and the installation had many, va many variables. I, for example, look at the symbolic use of the landscape, and they were somewhat monumental. These pictures become large and then become monumental. They have the solidity of a monument. They are sculptures. Something which is in two dimensions can talk to the space around it as a sculpture. And there was also a narrative. This picture, for example, by Robert Kappa was taken mid-January 1939, a few days before the Franco army entered the city and the war ended. And these people here, they were survivors of the war. They still had a lot of the dictatorship ahead of them, but they survived the war. In the other end of the city, in La Barceloneta, this picture belongs to the first air raid, May 1937, the beginning of the war, and many of the people represented here would die during the war. And in that case, the treatment as a sculptor is different. The old picture contains the landscape around it. Rambla, such a touristy spot, with a picture by Ramon Parera. A propaganda picture, people in uniforms, keeping private goods safe after an attack. And this is no Photoshop, this is the installation, uh, the actual physical installation. Size matters. And here I concerned myself with other inputs, such as, for example, the perspective of the body and, and, and the way to look at the picture. The picture should be large enough so that you have to look at it with your whole body, not just with your eyes. You need to move towards the place and you watch with your entire body and at the same time it is claiming a critical perspective the picture reveals information that was always there but wouldn't come to light until we take a look at the picture in place and this gives thinking food for thought to the observer and it makes the observer think of their own perspective which is much more than a topographical spot. It's an ideological spot as well. Where are we looking at these pictures from? The same picture that a friend of mine, Tavi Mulet, also a photographer, took a picture from, from his car. You can take a look. You can, you can see pictures from many perspectives. And also the Google Maps picture of this picture. It was. It's interesting to, to think that this was an ephemeris installation uh, with a life of a few months, and the Google car gave it a longer life, although virtual. This piece has two si had two sides. On the other side, the Google car also took a picture of it. And this is the picture we saw at the beginning by Robert Kappa, also photographed by the Google car. And lately, I've been working I've been working on the contemporary perception of those pictures, the Silver Bullets, Palas de Plata project, which started as a teaching project and is now becoming a book, an essay on the uses of photography during the Civil War. A small example from the Umbral magazine, published in Valencia and Barcelona, with this magnificent cover, for example, with two pictures and possibly 
collage by Kathy Orna, Austro-Hungarian photographer. She was a photographer, but also a graphic editor, a very important role. The person who edits the, the piece of news, who does the DTP. And there were also details of reality that she took pictures on to incorporate them into her photo montages. This is Plaza Nova, which has come up a few times over these couple of days. Kathy Orna took a couple of pictures or maybe more here, and subsequently this photo montage, which was entitled The Spanish Woman Before the Revolution. For a few months, the civil war was a social revolution, and the memory of that has disappeared, not so much because of the uh, Franco regime that fell on top of it, but also because of the Stalinist repression on May 37. And again, here, Curribia Street on the left-hand side, which disappeared during the bombings, or after the bombings. Karma said yesterday that a conflict marks a city and there are consequences of the word that we need to attach a meaning to. And this is on this sovereign gaze, this, this bodily gaze that I mentioned, looking with your entire body. And this is an exhibit I did in our piece of work I did in Tarragona, 13 dark flags, Tereta Banderas Foscas, to commemorate the end of the dictatorship, and it's this one. The pictures in this installation show the bombings in Tarragona during the Spanish Civil War. The pictures were taken by the attackers after dropping the bombs. So it is a city at the time in which it was being destroyed by their future rulers. And the authors, it was they were taken by the authors of the attacks. Every once in a while, we could see a plane in the sky which, which would remind us of the conditions in which these pictures were taken. The pictures had been taken from above, uh, far above, uh, but these pictures on these flagpoles asked the viewers to again use their entire body to look up and take a look at the pictures and to think of the fragile victims of these metallic attacks when the victorious attackers would become the rulers of the beaten state. And these pictures were used as flags, as dark flags on these metallic posts to speak of the exercise of power. These the banners, flags, represent collectives. And from my point of view, I think we need to observe them all in a critical light before deciding whether we want for a flag to represent us. These flags were based on pictures such as this one. Ramon talked about these pictures taken by the Italians while they were bombing and they were learning how to bomb. The pictures, these authentic uh, pictures are solid objects and they have two sides. Very revealing, both of them. Here, for example, we can recognize the perpetrators that Ramon Arnavat talked about before. And this is, uh, there's information about the plane, the Savoy 79, a model developed in between wars in those sporting races, the Schneider Cup, for example. And we can now see the sinister meaning of those sporting competitions. And then at the bottom, we can also see the names of the persons. Sototenente Barastillo, maybe Ramon knows these names. And even the photographer observing 
photographer Maori or Manui or something like that. We don't know exactly. These are the perpetrators. In the end, it is an installation that encouraged viewers to look a flag in the eye. And I invite you to, to look a flag in the eye for a few moments, to hold its gaze. And that would be enough for now. And I'm almost, I'm almost done. Just allow me to tell you a personal story, which links these projects with my family story, and this may explain why I do this. And this comes from the project that I told you about at the beginning, the material with which you fill out a crater. Back then, my mom, who started showing the signs of Alzheimer's, lived at home with me and I showed her pictures. And I showed her this picture, for example, taken at San Felipe Neri. This is black and white. And you see the girls from the Antonio Solis uh, school who were in this shelter. It was not an air raid shelter. It was a shelter for refugee children. And my mom told me that she had had bows like the ones these girls were, these white taffeta bows. And well, for years now, Alzheimer has invaded her entire body and soul. And I went through boxes and I found a picture of her with this taffeta white bow. She was a refugee child. Her parents sent her to Taberno, our village in Almeria, close to Murcia. They sent her there to take her away from the hunger and mainly away from the bombings. She went by boat and when she told me about it, I got the shudders because it was a boat that was traveling through waters that were infested with Italian submarines. And she also told me, and this is interesting, that the family who she was shipped to, they got the money for the ticket. So she was not only a refugee, uh, but she was also a stowaway. She never paid the ticket. The, the relatives uh, got the money from the ticket. And she was photographed in this place twice by the same photographer. And she told me that for those years, those years she spent her, the, there during the war and the post-war, these were the happiest years of her life. Childhood is a happy time. But these happy days were darkened by the sound that she imagined was an, an, an air raid siren. My great-grandmother got her on a donkey and took her to a townhouse and showed her how the woman there told the family that uh, lunch was ready by blowing a horn, like these horns from the Iron Age that David García and Roberto, archaeologist, shared in social media recently, and that was discovered in San Juan Madalcana in 2001. So that's the horn that she heard and, and mistook for an air raid siren. And in the same box where I found the pictures, I found another object. I apologize. Maybe it was the lost pendant from broken necklace. But the proximity with the pictures it was found with makes me think that this small mollusk was for Anita, for my mom, the memory 
of the day when she believed that there would be no more bombs. And now I am indeed done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricard. Thanks for sharing your family story. Thanks to the four of our panelists. I think that we have heard many examples on how we can recover the memory from the bombings. And it was the aim of this panel to connect different disciplines. I would like to ask you if you believe that the different disciplines are connective enough in order to recover this memory, or if we can do more because from art, from history, from archaeology, maybe we can do more in order to recover, to build this memory. I don't know, Christina, if I was talking about this connection between disciplines uh, when it comes to create memory. And in fact, you have collaborated and with all this gathering of information there has been a teamwork researching bombings it's a teamwork Refugees from Syria have been documenting the bombings in Syria or researchers from uh, Chinese universities to tell us about the bombings, the Japanese bombings on China. But uh, we were told no way of uh, documenting the bombings of the Chinese were. The Chinese wanted to document the bombings done on China but uh, not the other way around. So we were talking with the University of the Philippines because uh, they want to tell about uh, damage being done to them. So telling these stories cannot be done from a single point of view because otherwise uh, we would always be on the side of the propaganda. So we have to s constantly be checking where this information comes from to put them all together. So Jordi, this is interesting. What we remember, what we don't, what we memorialize and what we don't. And yeah, and what I say the first day, uh, we're never the, the, the responsible ones or the guilty ones. It's always the other one. But at the end of the day, it's always a decision what we remember and what we don't. And when we have to decide on what we act, what we do, what we do is a political, it's a personal decision. And we were talking about how to organize or how we manage all these spaces, all these memories, um, ways that maybe have to be more spontaneous, more creative. But at the same time, they need to be organized all these ways. We must make decisions on how to manage. And this is a responsibility of the different authorities, the researchers, the artists uh, will collaborate with the administration, with the authorities. It's something that might seem obvious, but Sometimes authorities don't work this way. And memory sometimes is not a priority for public policies. And let's see what happens here in Catalonia. Let's see um, how much we will be able to invest in order to have a spaces finally here in Catalonia, spaces that can be visited where our students can go and even tourists, why not, 
for to have these spaces. You have mentioned several examples, and I would like to ask our audience, what do you think about creativity, the role of art in the memorializations of bombings? I don't know if the audience have uh, has questions about uh, the presentations, about uh, install Christina's installations or Ricard uh, project or about what Jordi or Laia have mentioned. No, no questions? I see Karma Miró here. And the footprints of the war in the cities of Barcelona, it says that uh, giving value to all these uh, structures contributes to peace. Up to now, it seemed that uh, studying the war would lead to more violence, but the perception has changed. How we manage this culture of peace in your projects? Laia, for instance, these marks in the buildings. What's the meaning for the new generations? I will, unfortunately, I wasn't. I couldn't attend yesterday's session, but I fully agree with what you have mentioned. We've been working in contemporary archaeology in other areas, and we know that. Uh, there are lots of different sensibilities. We want to know more about war, and people from different fields get together. However, we got more interested by the everyday life, um, people's life, that regardless of their um, political position, how they experience the war. And we think that this memory, this heritage, can become an educational tool. At the beginning, for us, it was a popular a citizen's tool. But then we have seen that it has an educational potential. And this is why we have been organizing seminars. And we can see that if if public policies do not reach students or the population, uh, well, it's dif it's difficult for the citizens or the students to appropriate these public policies. So, but we have seen that when students have access to documents, when they see the material, <coughs> when they see all this contact, content, um, they learn in a different in a different way, and they adopt a different role. And I know that this is difficult to manage how we manage and preserve heritage. It's a difficult heritage when it comes to preservation, to preserve it. I think um, having knowledge or having this uh, census of the different marks can help us and can help us to make decisions whether we want to preserve it or not. Yeah, I think that if we appropriate this, uh, if we appropriate, appropriate this um, legacy, this heritage would be a way also of involving the whole citizen yeah, I think the connection is something automatic. When we talk about photography, something universal is something democratic. And I think that it calls for the citizens' participation. When I set up an installation, I like to um, stay there physically and hear um, the citizens' comments. What do they say when they see a picture and they compare the image with the surrounding area. They talk about the point of view, and uh, they, they, they talk about the picture. And 
I have mentioned that before. I think that uh, people have a critical view and, and they look the picture with the whole body. And it's our task, the artist's task, tasks, to provide more tools like this one for citizens to participate. And you've done that with uh, your installation, Cristina, El Rayo Que No Cesa. How did the, the audience react? I think that people feel empathy. They are shocked at the beginning because the, the, the war that hurts the most is your war, but then you feel empathic with other words, words and with the pain of other people and being aware of how many words existed that we didn't know about and uh, how, for instance, the contemporary war that happen in during our lifetime that sometimes we see on television but oftentimes we don't so these permanent wars that exist in the world and people feel empathy when i presented for the first time the project in uh, madrid in alcala 33 there was the news that the basque firefighter had refused to let go a load of some fuel that had to go to the Yemen war. And the firefighter said no. No, because this is uh, going to go to uh, Yemen, no. And the Spanish government had a, we a weapon industry and that uh, gives income, generates income. So here there are some contentious issues. So people start thinking when they visit the exhibition. We have one minute left. Karma, I think you want to say something? Yeah. Thank you for um, mention a sentence that I wrote years ago, and I still think the same. And I think it's been proven with today's intervention. I like to work or to be part of a team, because I don't think that uh, we can achieve things individually. And we have to um, work in a multidisciplinary way. And I think that Ricard's uh, work have reached the citizens. And I have visited uh, his installations, and I have looked at them from different points of, the, of view. Laia, I have had the opportunity to work with her. I think these are little drops in the ocean, but that will really help us. And we have to explain, explain. We have to talk about the war in order to be able to talk about peace. We have to talk about bombings to talk about social organization. If we go to a higher school, probably many students don't know that Barcelona was bombed or Guernica was bombed. And I'm mentioning Guernica because we have Picasso's painting. Or maybe they don't know who Franco go was. And this is difficult to accept because we have uh, made a big chunk of our history to disappear. And it has happened in Europe, too. And Jordi mentioned that, too. We all say, oh, we've done very well, but we don't want to talk about our past. Here, what memory do we recover, the ones that uh, are, mm, revolted or the others? I think that we have to recover all memories because they are interconnected. And the only way of doing is uh, working in teams. And I would like to thank the artists because uh, if we have been able to organize the seminar is because Ana Sanchez uh, has contributed um, 
Ricard has been working for many years. I didn't know uh, about the Christina's work, but I think this is really important. Teamwork and talk to new generations. Education is important because if we don't talk to new generations, we will be distorting history. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all your work. It's been a pleasure to be part of this panel. Last question. I would like to say something that has to do with a witness I uh, gathered when I was doing my research concerning the approach of uh, your presentations. And I think that we should understand that we all have an emotional relationship with the events that happened. And after a while, we can look in hindsight to try to understand what happened. But I think the how we experience with our body, that's very important. Um, now, uh, when we go into several spaces, I think that we have to understand that sometimes it's difficult to understand what these people uh, experience, uh, people who suffered the war and us for a matter of a space and time uh, for us is difficult to experience so what i try to say is that when in i interview karma one of the first uh, women i interviewed that uh, suffered the war she told me that she was six seven years old during the war and she said that once the war was over <coughs> The city went back to certain normality, but when she hear a plane, she had to stop and think that the, the plane was not going to bomb the city. Now we hear the, the, a plane flying, and for us, uh, it's a means of transportation but we don't think that uh, we're going to be bombed. Or when we travel by a subway, well, for us, it's a means of transportation for them. Going underground, going into a shelter, was going into an unknown place. Another woman I could talk to, she was telling me that they didn't know if the shelter uh, was solid enough because it was underground so they didn't know if they were gonna die uh, because the shelter would collapse so I think that this body experience can help us when we try to understand the war, even to understand um, the reality of um, present time war. Yeah, it's what, Laia, you were saying, to, ex to have this body experience. Thanks to all of our panelists. I hope uh, you will have a fruitful second session today after lunch. And thanks to the organizer for having organized this seminar, which give us many different points of view. Thank you.